is Heritage Words, a podcast about how we engage with our ancestral languages in English. Heritage Words is produced by the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, which raises awareness about Jewish ancestral diversity through the lens of language. I'm your host, Sarah Bunin Benor. Today we're speaking to Danny Jason, whose ancestral languages include Ladino. Danny, I'll be asking you about your ancestors and Ladino, but first I want to know a little bit more about you. Where did you grow up and where do you live now? Grew up in Seattle, specifically Seward Park, uh, and I've lived Seward Park, New York, Israel, and now back to Seward Park. And what line of work are you in? Uh, finance, finance, residential lending, sales, basically. Okay, so are you involved in a Jewish community? Yes. Can you tell uh, us about that community? Sure. I'm involved in the Seattle Sephardic community, a member of Sephardic Sikor uh, involved with Sephardic Adventure Camp, former camper, former counselor, former camp director, second round on the Seattle, uh, Sephardic Adventure Camp board. Um, so I'm uh, fairly involved. Um, you know, all my kids uh, are, they go to the Seattle Hebrew Academy, North Yeshiva High School. They participate in uh, events at the synagogue and in Seward Park, you know, greater Seward Park, not just uh, the synagogue, but greater Seward Park events. So for listeners who aren't familiar with Seattle, tell us more about Seward Park and the synagogue Sephardic Bikur Cholim. Okay, so Seward Park is sort of the new Jewish neighborhood. Uh, my grandparents, great grandparents grew up in the Central District, where most of all Seattle Jews grew up when they first came to Seattle. And then in the, I believe it's the late 60s, early 70s, everyone sort of moved out of the Central District. And the main uh, Sephardic community and, you know, Orthodox community moved to the Seward Park area. And so my family's been here uh, since, let's see, we came here in the 80s. Um, my Nona and Papa lived in Tacoma. They lived in Seattle and they moved to Tacoma for a while. Uh, but we settled here in, uh, in the early, early 80s uh, in Seward Park. And Seward Park is made up of, today it's made up of four synagogues, uh, two Sephardic synagogues, two Ashkenazic synagogues. Uh, growing up as a kid, there were three main synagogues, two Sephardic, one Ashkenazic. The two Sephardic synagogues are Sephardic Bikul Cholim, which is traditionally what they would call a of Turkish descent and Ezab Sarod, which is traditionally of uh, Rodasli descent. I mean, the big funny joke is that if you go to each synagogue, you kind of got a little bit of everything at each one. So, um, but that's sort of the history and sort of if I were to explain to somebody what the Seward Park neighborhood looks like. Okay. And you mentioned Sephardic Adventure Camp. What is that? That is the, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the, it's the only overnight Sephardic religious camp in all of uh, North America, might be even in the world, I don't know, but I could speak to North America. Uh, it's a camp that uh, started in 1948, uh, sort of a, hey, let's take the kids away for the weekend. And now over time, it's grown into uh, the two Sephardic synagogues supporting the camp, having separate weeks to blending the camp together between the two synagogues. And what that means is basically just the membership, of the kids of two synagogues. To today, where it's its own, uh, to get technical, its own 5013 seats, its own entity that uh, is a camp that lasts about 20 days every summer uh, that's infused with Sephardic culture, Sephardic heritage, uh, Sephardic kefila, Sephardic food, uh, and Sephardic pride. And it's uh, about uh, an hour away from Seattle, up in Cleo. Uh, it was hosted by counselors now from kids from majority are from the Seattle area, but this, it's now grown to sort of international camp. We have kids from all over the U.S. that come and kids from all over the world, counselors from all over the world that want to come and be a part of this. So, um, Okay, great. So you're, you said you go to Sephardic Bikur Cholim, which is primarily Turkish. Does that mean your ancestors are from Turkey? Uh, on my Sephardic side, my ancestries are half, uh, great-grandfather is Turkish, great-grandmother is from Rodas. So uh -huh. A they might have been, yes, they might have been one of the first mixed marriages ever in Seattle. That was 1912 they got married. So wow. that was, uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. 
And uh, quite honestly, it might have been the first mixed marriage, might not be, but it was it was pretty, uh, I don't know. So yeah, so we joke about it being a mixed marriage, but they were speaking the same language with different accents, right? Yeah, one ended with O and one ended with U. Right, so, okay, so they were speaking yeah. Ladino, which is your, yeah. one of your ancestral languages. You mentioned that you have another side that's not Sephardic, is that Ashkenazi? Yeah. And where, where are those ancestors from? Uh, Eastern Europe, kind of all over. I mean, I think it's kind of, there's no, you know, the borders have shifted uh, over time. So uh, predominantly just Eastern Europe. Okay. So when did your ancestors arrive in the U.S.? And there might be multiple answers for that. So my great-grandfather who came from, uh, he was born in Rodosto, Turkey, which today they call it Tahirdad. Uh, he came in 1909. Uh, on the, I can even tell you the boat he came on and everything and the date he came and it's all I have is he filled out, I have a copy of his declaration of intention, which is uh, he filled out in, um, it looks like 1930 something, it's hard to tell, but when he applied for his U.S. citizenship. So he came over in uh, July 9th, 1909 on the SS Atlanta through New York. So I get really specific for you. Wow. Um, and did he didn't take a train across the country? Uh, assuming he took a train across the country because he had a relative here, or that was sort of the message, right, for all the Jews that came from Western Turkey is, hey, come to Seattle. That's where everyone is. Mm -hmm. um, and then my great grandmother, her name was Perla Franco. She was born in uh, 1894 in Rodez, and she came to America in 1911. And they got married. It's interesting. I mean, she got, they got married a year later. They got married in April of 1912. So again, I mean, most of the most of the Sephardic Jews came sort of in that period, right, of 19, 1908, 1907, through the beat, you know, through World War One and even after. But as far as I know, it's one of the first mixed marriages that, uh, again, jokingly, like mixed marriages at the time. But like you said, they spoke the same language. Essentially, the culture is the same. Uh, the food is essentially the same, I mean, to a certain degree, um, and they were married, and then they had seven children. One of them was my grandfather, um, and he was born in, my grandfather was born in 1915 in Seattle, and he had a twin brother. Uh, they were identical twins. Wow, and then your Ashkenazi side, do you know when they arrived in the U.S.? Um... No, I think they came. Uh, they came before between World War One, World War Two. I believe they came. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I didn't. I uh, know none of my family on at either side was affected by the Holocaust. Um, they, I think, they were all in America or all out of Eastern Europe by that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you feel? that your Ladino uh, ancestry, your Sephardic ancestry is more salient in your life because you're part of this Sephardic community? 100%. I mean, that's, so I, I grew up in this community with tons of cousins that were all, we were all, you know, and then you grow up with your, for example, like, some of the best friends that I have today, my parents were friends with them, but my our grandparents were best friends growing up. So it's like second, third generation to where, you know, everyone sort of feels like that part of the, oh, yeah, your grandfather and I were best friends. Oh, you didn't know that? Well, here's a picture of me and your, me and your papu skiing on Mount Rainier. I have a picture of, uh, you know, one of my good friends and my papu, they were skiing in 1936 on Mount Rainier. We have a picture of it. It's wow. like they were they were best friends. And then okay, so the children were friends, they married, but now like the grandkids, you know, then my kids are friends with their kids, and it's just they, you know, kind of just continues on with that familiarity. Wow, that's beautiful. And I guess probably the uh not just the social networks, but also the institutions play a role in that, like Sephardic Bikur Cholim, Ezra Basarath, and uh Sephardic Adventure Camp, right? Yeah, I mean, camp was probably the, Sephardic Adventure Camp was sort of the one thing that brought everyone together, because there were a lot of kids or a lot of families that maybe don't live in Seward Park, don't frequent the synagogue, you know, on a weekly basis, maybe they just come for certain holidays or certain events, but all the kids growing up, no matter what, went to Sephardic Adventure Camp, and that was sort of the equalizer in terms of, uh, 
that was the equalizer in terms of uh, everyone kind of spending time together and, and and getting to know each other and then infusing that sort of like when you're young that Sephardic culture, that Sephardic pride and like, you know, here's how things are done here. This is how we do things. This is why we do it. Uh, and this is why we have a lot of pride in it. Uh, and that's sort of infused in sort of uh, that daily activity of the camp. And then when you come back and then there's all that energy that all the kids and the counselors and every the teenagers were bringing it back to the synagogues and try and get it to last as long as they could through the year. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think Seattle is unique in that way. I think in uh, America today, there are no other places where you get that feeling of a rich Sephardic community where Ladino is still very important besides Seattle. Do you think that's true or do you know of other places like that? No, I think it's very true. I think Seattle's unique. There's a sort of a blessing and a curse to that. The blessing is that we're far away from the rest of the other major cities where new immigrants, like new Sephardic immigrants, sort of that came in the, that I would say that came in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, more went to bigger cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami, New York, and settled there. And they weren't necessarily from Latino speaking communities. They were more like North African communities or Middle Eastern communities. And so, there wasn't such an influx of new uh, of sort of new immigrants to sort of reinfuse that. So Seattle's done this incredible job for over a hundred years of holding on to everything and trying to pass it on to the next generation while they're while without having on the other hand, you don't have sort of like what the other big cities have where you have all of a sudden a new wave of all of a sudden like the Moroccan jewelry, for example, infused in Los Angeles or in Miami, where all of a sudden there's this new wave and you know, sort of reinvigorates the community a little bit. So it kind of forced Seattle to really focus on themselves and really focus on, hey, here's what we do. We're going to really work hard to keep these traditions and and be proud of them and uh, and represent. So again, it's very unique out here. I agree. Yeah. So sounds like your heritage languages are Ladino and Yiddish, but Ladino is the one that is more salient in in your family, right? Yeah, we didn't really grow up or hear any Yiddish growing up. There was no real Yiddish speakers in the family uh, yeah. at all, other than, you know, I guess what I would say is like words that everybody in the world uses. In Yiddish, yeah, so. yeah. Okay, yeah. so tell us about your family's uh, in Ladino. So you, obviously your great-grandparents spoke it. Did your grandparents also? Yeah, my grandparents spoke it. My parents, you know, or my mom's family, they didn't really speak it, but it was like, they understood, they understood the, you know, and it's sort of like, right, each generation might be a little bit less and less, but it's like, okay, you go from speaking it to the next generation spoke it because that was their parents' language to uh, what, what, hap what I would say was what happened in America or in Seattle in the, you know, in sort of my parents' generation, there was a bit, or even my grandparents' generation, there was big push to be, oh, we want to be American, we want you know, we're the first generation born here. We want to figure out how to assimilate into American society. And sometimes, and some families sort of lost the, you know, you know, kind of went a little bit too far and sort of lost the, you know, the Sephardic identity or, or that reinforcing, let's keep our, you know, that language at home going because there was such a push to want to be part of American society back then. Yeah, and um, I think that was the norm at that time in the yeah. early to mid 20th century. It was pretty rare for families to say, hey, this is an important language. Let's maintain it. Right, because they always probably believed it was always going to be able to maintain. So um, it, it's uh, it's easier said than done. Maybe, you know, you don't realize how many people don't speak it or you think everyone speaks it. You know, or you think all Jewish people speak. You don't you don't really know. Right. Uh, again, Seattle's very sort of, uh, you know, at the, you know, top north corner, you know, the northwest corner of America. So you don't get so many people that come up here or, you know, my parents generation didn't leave so much. Most of the people, my parents generation, all married people from Seattle. I can say that most people, my friends, the majority of them all married people from outside of Seattle. It's just like, you know, like every generation sort of the globalization of Jewish dating sort of just changes and opened up more, mm. you know, where my grandparents, yeah, you married somebody in your neighborhood. 
from mm-hmm. where my parents are to be married somebody Jewish in the region mm-hmm. to my generation. We married people from all over the world. Yeah. Or at yeah. Least so you mentioned a few Ladino words already. You mentioned Nona and Papu. Yeah. Uh, can you first tell us what those mean and, and maybe where they come from. Uh, so Papu refers to grandfather, Nona refers to grandmother. I don't know where they come from. That's what they told us to call them. So, because okay, probably so that's what you grew up calling your your maternal grandparents Nona and Papu, Papu. right? Yeah, Papu. Okay. Yeah. Um, what other words that uh, have been passed down the generations to you? Ooh. So, I mean, there's a lot of words. Like, if you were to focus on uh, food, I mean, I, I mean, food was always right. Food's very important. In, Jewish culture, especially in Sephardic culture. Uh, my family, we just grew up with, you know, a lot of food. Uh, and so, I mean, you had your traditional foods, like, right, your boreka, your bulema, your bizcochos, but then, you know, then you have, what's your family favorite? So my house, they always made fideos. Fideos was a uh, Turkish pasta. Literally the word fideo means pasta, but like, it's a certain way of cooking it, a certain way of making it. So it was always like, are we having fideos tonight, right? Are we having, uh, it wasn't rice, it was eat, it, we were eating arroz, right? That's how it was referred to. So I grew up not, you know, you grew up eating bread, you grew up eating panizikus, right? You, you, we didn't say, oh, do we have rolls? Do we have this? It was panizikus is what we have, right? We didn't have eggs, you had webus. Well, what kind of webus did you have? You know, and then it's webu haminadu, right? Shabbat eggs. Or did you have, you know, is it, uh, you know, and we grew up eating, um, that, that's sort of like, and then we have pishkadu, right? Oh, yeah, pishkadu during the week, but then on the holidays, it's, oh, yeah, pishkadu con huevo limon. That's like this fancy fish. And then you talk to your friends at synagogue, oh, did you have con limon or did you have con tomat? And they say, oh, I like con tomat, I like con tomat. It's like, and everyone has sort of like their version, right? It's sort of like, okay, well, we eat kojadu, right? Kojadu is, you know, Spanish kojadu, but some people make kojadu with calabasta, with the, uh, they make it with the, um, the, the squash, right, or a zucchini, right, and then it's like, okay, and then, you know, everyone has their versions of making everything like that, so the food is very apparent, how things were referred to growing up, it's just, in my, you know, my mom always referred to everything, right, we're not eating eggplant, you're eating benedetta, right, that's just, that's just, because that's how she grew up calling it, so she would just call that, you know, and so you learn that, um, and then, I mean, that's just the food. And then you have all the, you know, as a kid, the stuff you grew up, you were called growing up. Stop being such a jambas, right? Stop being such a crazy character, right? Put on your bragas. Nobody used the word underwear growing up, right? It was only bragas. And then you go to camp, everyone's the bragas. Oh, he's your braga brother. He's this. It's all it was is bragas, right? What does that mean, uh, braga brother? That was like, that was our names at the camp, right? Oh, that was where it's my braga brother. We were in camp together, so... (laughs) That was probably the name of our cabin when we were like eight years old. So for the rest of our life, oh, he's my Braga brother. You know, we're the Braga brothers. Oh, that's great. Actually, when so. I visited uh, Sephardic Adventure Camp in maybe 2015 for my research, their Bragas were very common, were very uh, prominent, I would say. In fact, they had Ladino word of the day. And yeah. the, the week that I was there, it was Bragas. And the okay. the guy would, uh, one of the counselors would come in with underwear on his head and say, the word of the day is Bragas. Braga. Okay. Yeah, we used to have it put up on the flagpole. That's what it was. The flagpole <laughs> would raise, we didn't raise a flag, we raised Bragas on the flagpole. <laughs> so, I mean, it's all fun stuff when you're a kid, right? To get you into that. But we used to have a really nice lady, Lenny Lamarche. She would come to camp and at camp was every day the Ladino word of the day. I mean, that's a tradition like you experienced. So camp in the 80s was, okay, the Latino word of the day. And that's where you learn, right, Bragas. That's where you learn, you know, different types of words that, uh, or, uh, I mean, and then you have all the sayings, right? So you have sayings like, um, you know, my mom used to say, you know, why are you so tired, right? You, you look tired. And then there, because there was a saying, durmiendo la piel, you're tired. He's so tired, he's like tired in his feet. Right. He's just like, you know, he can't, you know, his head's down. He's looking at his feet. He can't keep up. So every time you look tired, she would ask you, she would ask you that. Or, uh, you know, if you had a sad face, they would say, or you wanted to refer to somebody who looks sad all the time. You'd say, why are they such a cara de shabiao? Right. We just have to shabiao. It's the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. So we, there's a saying, you have a face of uh, to shabiao because they just look sad all the time. In English, they use different terms for that, right? But they, I mean, it's all, 
it's funny how you have it in every different language. You have references like that. So, um, I mean, you know, and then I just remember also my mom always saying to me, like, I can't take it anymore talking to her. She vaziard me to death, right? That's like she took a Ladino word and conjugated it almost into English to use it as an adjective. Okay, so the word she's using for the word vazio, that means like empty, but also means like she's, you know, person who talks nonsense. So you have like the word babajadas, which also means like nonsense, but that's like when someone says something that like, if you don't believe it, but then you have a vazio who's like talking nonsense all the time. So she used to use that term all the time, like, oh my God, he's, she's vaziaring me to death, you know, like she's English, she took it and made it English, you know? She made it is, into uh, a word. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they used to, and my, because my papa had a twin brother, I'm sort of like throwing you Ladino words and Ladino things, so stop me if you want more specific, but because he was a twin brother, they didn't call them by their names, they didn't call them Albert or Jack, they call them the Bajuks, that's the Ladino word for twins, oh, wow. and they, so they ask you, who, who are you, I said, oh, I'm Danny Jason, they, okay, who's your grandfather, I said, uh, Albert Benezra, and then, and then, someone who, who in that person maybe didn't know that didn't know my papu by his name so his friend said oh you know one of the bajuks he goes oh okay i know exactly who you are like that's <laughs> how they were referred to because they were identical twins nobody could tell them apart so uh -huh. that was their nicknames the bajuks so if you ask somebody who grew up with my grandparents or like my parents generation you know about the the Benezra twins they'll say oh yeah the bajuks so wow so I'm sure you have more words on your list and I, I hope we'll have time to get to those, but I have some questions about the words you've sure. already mentioned. Do you think that these words were used just in your family or in the broader Sephardic community in Seattle? Uh, in the broader community, there are some words that maybe like my family might use more than others just because, you know, maybe my mom's Nona used those words more than others, but I think there you go to other families and the words are very intertwined. Some families have words specific that they use all the time. So maybe, you know, maybe there's a small percentage like growing up also uh, a word that's maybe not a lot of people use is the word kanimazu. I don't know if you ever heard that word, but it means a rag. So all right, usually you hear, oh, he's in the shmata business, right? That's the Yiddish word that even non-Jewish people, everybody knows what that word means. But in Seattle, Growing up, you would never hear, oh, about the person who, you know, my Uncle Raymond, who was in the Kanimazu business, right? He sold rags all over the world type of thing. So that's like a word that maybe, you know, like you say that and not everybody knows that word because it's a very specific word that maybe my family used because my uncle was in that business and my cousins uh -huh. are in that business. But that, so that's an example. But like most other words, like, you know, most people I would say, you know, would know, like if you use the words you know, jambas, pishkadu, for fish, pisgadu, he's driving me nuts, stop piscar. Again, my mom would use that word in English, I'd stop piscaring me, right? Piscara, you know, it means like uh, someone who's a piscadu is uh, you're annoying me, stop annoying me. So she would Englishize it, so to speak. Um, so, so you mentioned your parents and your grandparents using these words. Do you use them as well with your friends or with your children? So with my friends, we use a lot of Latino words that we grew up using, sort of intertwined. Uh, my children, yes. So my children are a little unique in the fact that uh, we're also fluent Hebrew speakers in my house because my wife is from Israel. My two out of my four kids were born in Israel. But so we all, so that's sort of the, I was going to also kind of explain to you or sort of give you the evolution that I, on a personal level that I think about, you know, using Latino, using the lexicon is that. You know, sort of going forward, I see, you know, Hebrew is really this, the language of the, of the future for Jewish people, right? As much as we have all these beautiful languages from all over the, you know, Middle East and Eastern Europe and North Africa, you know, I, me on a personal level, I think that Hebrew is the future, right? Israel is the future. It's the center of, of Jewish life today. Uh, and so it's important that you understand how to speak and read and write Hebrew. But with that said, uh, I also think it's important to keep the lexicon of those words going, you know, through generations. I think it would be hard to find someone in my generation who's going to say, oh, yeah, I speak fluent Latino, who did, doesn't, didn't grow up in Turkey right now. And even kids that I think grew up in Turkey right now don't really speak it fluently anymore because sort of that generation's been forced to speak Turkish and really, 
you know, I used to work with a gentleman when I lived in New York. I worked with a gentleman who was Turkish from uh, Istanbul. He was maybe uh, 15 years older than me. He spoke fluent Latino, but he's like, you know, most people who were my generation, like it's just sort of even in Turkey, it's just less and less because of the Turkish nationalism that's happening there and everything. Um, so, yeah, most of, most of the speakers of Ladino today are in their 70s and older. And yeah. uh, that is why it's officially classified as an endangered language. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, unfortunate. I just think it's the, you know, I think it's also just the the shift in like, again, in in sort of Hebrew becoming, a, you know, the main language for, you know, the main language that unites Jewish people, right? Um, that That's, you know, so my kids, so we focus a lot on Hebrew, but I think my kids could give you how to say the word eggplant in Ladino and in Hebrew. And most of the food they could give you in three languages. Uh, but like the sayings of like, Kadesh Shabayav or, or Salud y Vida and stuff like that, like they probably, they're much more, it's much more Hebrew versus Ladino for them. So yeah. they also spent eight years out of their life living in Israel. So they didn't hear a lot of Ladino other than me. And they looked at me like, where are you from? You're crazy. <laughs> Wait, Until so we move back to Seattle, and then they are like, okay, now I understand. They go to <laughs> Safari Convention again. They come to the synagogue, and now they understand, okay, you're not so, you know, you don't speak this weird language. All of your friends speak this weird language, so to speak. You know, yeah. You know, well, wait, so when you were in Israel, did you speak to them in Hebrew? Uh, I spoke to them uh, in English and Hebrew. I mean, I didn't, you know, my Hebrew got better and better as we lived there, but uh, I mean, they were little kids. They did not really speak English when we moved back to Seattle. My daughter was born in Seattle and we moved to Israel when she had just turned two. So she didn't really speak yet. And even when her first language she would hear was from my wife, which is Hebrew. And then we moved to Israel. And that's why, you know, in Hebrew, when you say your, it's called mother tongue. Right? And I was like, why did I always call it mother tongue? Spot M mother tongue because you realize that the men are always out and the women were home speaking to the children right that's how now it sort of sounds like very old style but then uh you know i happened to work in yeah, north american hours in israel so every afternoon i was away and the kids would be in school all day learning hebrew then they come home and there's just hebrew speakers at home so they didn't really get a chance to speak a lot of english to them mm -hmm. um no that's and so my what about now how old are your children now now they're 18, 15, 12, and 3. And do you still speak a combination of English and Hebrew at home to them? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and very so, mixed mixed house. Yeah. And so how do you incorporate Ladino? Is it more in your English or in your Hebrew? Or it's is more it in the English. It's more in the English. It's more around, you know, uh, a lot of the food. It's also, but they go to camp every year. My kids are been at camp for years, so they're around it all the time. Sometimes they make, they laugh at me and make fun of me, but then, but they also, but then they just, I find them doing it themselves. So, but like, if I refer to anything, you know, in like any type of food in Latino, they understand what I'm saying. They understand what it is. So yeah. Wait, you um, said you find them doing it themselves, doing what themselves, using the Meaning they, like they use the words. They'll use those words because like, they were just, uh, for example, like uh, web, right? So egg, they won't say, oh, the big scene. They won't refer to it in Hebrew. They won't refer to it in English. They'll say web, or they'll say prasa, right? My kids love to eat prasa. Prasa is Ladino for leek. Even in Israel, it's the one Ladino word I found in Israel that all the Israelis know what it means. It's the Ladino word for uh for leak in is prasa but i found that most people in israel understood what the word prasa is so wow i wonder if that's from the uh simanim for rosh hashanah it could be it could be from rosh hashanah but they, it's not you know the word is actually you know it's a hebrew word but we just call it prasa. i don't know or maybe it's just my mother-in-law understood it so uh it's just they always refer to it as prasa maybe they did uh -huh. it for me i don't know um, do you, in your home, sing any Ladino songs or, like, for example, Birkat Hamazon, do you do you do Bendigamos or Yakomimos? Or Yakomimos, the kids all know Yakomimos, yeah. We grew up singing Yakomimos. Which is, uh, can you tell us about that? So Yakomimos is a Ladino, is a paragraph at the end of Birkat Hamazon, the, the blessing after the meal, that uh, it's sort of a, 
uh, I guess a summary. It's basically, it's a, you know, the entire Birkat Ramadan is really a thank you. Are you thanking, you know, God for this meal, this food for everything? And then, so it's sort of a, a poetic form of saying thank you in Ladino. Uh, and it's essentially just thanking the, the, the creator of the world, the, you know, the, um, as in Latino, the grande, you know, the, the, the master for everything that's provided to us. Uh, and it's very poetic. It's a beautiful, you know, it takes 30 seconds to sing. And like the, I would tell you that every kid that goes to camp comes out of there, even if it's your first time there and you never go there again, learns that thing and they can sing it their entire life. So. Wow. Uh, um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you mind singing a little bit of that for us? <laughs> uh, Okay, sure. Ya comimos y bebimos y el yo santo barujo baruch shemo bendishimos que mos yo y mos dará pa para comer y para niños para andestir y años muchos y buenos para vivir. El padre el grande que mande el chico hasta que tenemos de menester para nuestras casas y para nuestras hijas. That's just three quarters of it. Wow, that's amazing. Um, wow, and I noticed in there you have uh, muchos y buenos, which is uh, a, a phrase that I've heard a lot in, in the Sephardic community. Can you Do you hear that as well, be, beyond that prayer? Yeah, you are, I mean, that's just a, you know, muchos y buenos, like, uh, you know, you know, you hear that a lot. You hear salud y vida, you hear saludos, saludos, like healthy, like only health, right? In Hebrew, you always hear, Rock Briuk, right? Only health, right? Only health. In Ladino, they would say saludosos, right? Just only health, just be healthy, right? You say salud y vida, it's a healthy, healthy life, right? Every time we have Kiddush on Shabbat, my mom would, before she would drink, salud y vida, right? Toast to healthy in life, right? And then you'd have muchos like, right? Like how Ashkenazi, oh, sorry. With health. No, it's okay, go ahead. I mean, Ashkenazi would say, would say l'chaim, right? L'chaim, and, right? To life, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so wait, so when would you use munchos y buenos then? So you would say uh, when someone has a celebration or when someone celebrates something, muchos y buenos, you know, like uh, for everyone, like, uh, you know, celebrations for everyone. Bueno, muchos, right? More buenos, good, more good, right? It's like, if you translate it literally, it sounds like, you you know, you speak, okay, more good. What is that? It's, it's, <laughs> right? It's like you have to take what it means, right? Take the, you know, you say, it, and I'll give you a perfect example. So there's a word that everybody uses, picado, right? Picado means, literally means, it's a sin, but nobody, so like, you didn't eat, right? So my mom would say, it's picado, I made this beautiful meal, you didn't eat it all. Like, it's not a sin that I didn't eat it, but she's saying like, you have to understand, right, what the word, you know, how you take the word and spin the literal to the non-literal translation of it. So muchos y buenos, right? So we should have many more, right? Uh, you know, many more celebrations, many more happy things, many more anything that's great. Yeah. Yeah, so in a few of the words you've mentioned, you've noted how their meaning or their use has changed, or in one case, you mentioned a noun becoming a verb. And that's pretty common when words transfer from one language to the other, that they change in meaning and use a little bit. Um, and I'm wondering if you can think of other examples of that, of words that you know mean something different in Ladino than they do in Sephardic Jewish English. Uh, oh, that's, I'm not, I'd have to think about that. Um... So it would be like more like again like like I would say you know the saying so like we're just saying like uh, oof, I could, I think it's a good question I, I need to uh, I need to think about that one though um, because you want um, I would say okay so you have a lot of sayings in Ladino right la boca cerrada no entra la mosca right keep your mouth keep your mouth shut so the flies not come in well what does that mean? That means don't say things out of your mouth that you shouldn't come out of your mouth, right? Just keep your mouth shut. So that's like an example, like, and everybody would, would you know, would know that term. Boca cerrada no entra en mosca, right? Don't let the flies come in. So keep your mouth shut. Just don't talk. Don't say anything. So that's, uh, you know, you, it means one thing, right? It literally means one thing, but it's actually, you know, we're not trying to tell you literally keep your mouth shut, right? The flies aren't actually coming in, but. Yeah, it. I love that. That's, That's great. Probably what I would say. So you've heard well, that just, is in the like from people beyond your family as well. Yeah, everybody. I think you, anybody in my generation, Seward Park, or you know, who has Latino grandparents would hear that term. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I would hope so. I think so. Do you also use any Ladino when you're talking to people outside of the Sephardic community? Uh, to Jewish people sometimes, yeah. But I, I mean, if you grew up in Seward Park and you weren't Sephardic, you would still understand it. Or if you went to like Sephardic camp, I mean, a lot of kids who were 100% Ashkenazic went there, came to Sephardic camp, uh, who maybe don't have Ladino speaking in the family. Or, uh, you know, a lot of them will understand certain words. You know, or they just, it's become so ingrained in like Seward Park lexicon that even the, you know, non Ladino people, like for example, the word pasencia, right? Pasencia means patience, right? I mean, you'll hear that everywhere. I don't know if you can hear a non Ladino person use it, but they 100% know what it means. Now, it's similar to the Spanish, uh, you know, use of the word that as well, but still, that's probably like, you know, one of the, the you know, one word that I would say that if you're not a, Ladino, again, not necessarily speaker, but if you didn't grow up hearing that, you know, but you grew up in Seward Park, you would know that word other than like food, right? I mean, food is obviously people are aware of, you know, food just from eating at different people's homes and celebrations. So it sounds like it's kind of comparable to the way that non-Jews in New York have picked up a lot of Yiddish. And so it's like there's New York English in that same way there's Seward Park Jewish English. That, yeah, to, I, yeah, maybe, maybe to a certain extent. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, you could say that. I mean, it's, they're so, it's so, um, it's rare that you find, uh, you know, families that don't have, you know, I would say now it's rare that you don't have families that have, you know, Sephardic Ashkenazi mixing it anymore uh, to where that they wouldn't hear that or wouldn't know that. Um, but you know, it happens. It's still apparent. Or they just, maybe they didn't have, you know, the grandparents grew up, you know, you never know. They just didn't hear a lot of Latino growing up. So, which can happen as well. Yeah. Um, so I, what, tell me about your associations when you hear Ladino words or when you hear people talking about Ladino. What are the associations and feelings you have? I mean, I associate it with my, with my, with my papu, with my, and his greater family, like my great aunts and uncles, um, and just like, you know, uh, my family history, and even more so just the connection to Seward Park and the whole, you know, uh, the greater neighborhood, the greater my, I would say like my, you know, my immediate family, my greater family, and then your greater, greater family, like it's just a little bit of pride, a little bit of understanding, like, hey, I, I know that, I hear that, I, I mean, I know exactly what you're saying, but totally, uh, you know, it just, it brings back like that, oh, familiarity of hearing that, you know, it's just nice to hear. Uh, in the same way, like when I would say me and my wife are traveling and you're in a total random place and all of a sudden she'll hear someone speaking Hebrew and she'll just, you know, she might not have any connection with them, might have no, you know, totally different people, different part of Israel, nothing, but it's like that familiar, you just kind of hear it and you're like, oh, you know, it just takes you back home a little bit, you know, it reminds you of, being a kid or, you know, when, you know, growing up and the different things you experience that maybe over time have slowed down because your greater family is older or not around anymore. And sort of like that, you know, that way of living or that culture is, it's, it's just different because of different influences. Mm. So, Do you also feel that way when you hear someone speaking Spanish? Uh, no, I, it's probably not um, because it's so different and so much um yeah no probably not i would say do you, do you have you studied spanish i did in high school uh and it was easy to learn it was a little bit easier to learn because just the familiarity with reading um but uh no and i mean i learned it and you learn it but then eventually i just you know i lived in israel i was studied in israel and then just the hebrew takes over and now it's Hebrew is like a, you know, much easier for me than, uh, than anything else. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned before that you think, feel that Hebrew is the future of the Jewish people um, and that Ladino is sadly endangered. Um, do you feel that Jews today should do more to keep Ladino alive? I, yeah, 100%. I mean, I think they should do more to, I don't know if it'll ever be a thriving language. You know, unfortunately, I mean, that would be awesome, you know, I don't, but 
we should be doing everything to, you know, keep the lexicon of the words of the phrases of the terms that we, you know, that are the, you know, that people use, um, you know, just the other day at synagogue, someone, you know, referenced something they use like, uh, they use the letters to, you know, and said something to somebody like, and they, it was a Latino term, but they didn't give you the whole term. All they use is the, the, the letters to spell. You had to figure it out yourself. And it's like, you know, it was just, I can't use the saying because it's not really, <laughs> it's not podcast appropriate, <laughs> but the point is, uh, the point is that like, it's still there. It still exists. I think to you, we should continue that, uh, but it's hard. I think it, it can continue in a place like Seattle where that is the majority of the Judaism that's practiced here. It's just the part of Judaism, the using the Latino culture, you know, as well. And it's like, it's up to, you know, people who are, you know, my parents' generation, or if they have grandparents still alive to, again, you know, use those words and those terms and everything. But it's, you know, it's not so simple today. I mean, again, I, you probably are much more of an expert on me by seeing all the, you know, studying all the different uh, Jewish languages about how it's incorporated into, you know, everyday life. It's, um, you know, yeah, you well, might have it, a better outside perspective than I do on that. Yeah, well, it seems from my outside perspective, from my prior, prior knowledge, but especially from this conversation, is that maintaining heritage words helps to preserve the language. It's an unrealistic expectation that Ladino will be vibrant again, that there'll be communities using it as their everyday language, but it's very realistic to hope and expect that the Sephardic community in Seattle will continue to use heritage words for generations to come. And you know, this can happen in families, but it's much more likely to be maintained if there is a more vibrant community where there are a number of people from that background and Seattle seems to be in that category. Yeah, I mean, you gotta have a, have a concentration of people. It can't just be one or two people or one or two families. It has to be a concentration of many families. It has to be the, you know, you have two synagogues that incorporated into their, you know, uh, liturgy. I mean, I think you experienced it when you were there uh, last week or two weeks ago, right? When you were there for the bidding of the mitzvot on Shabbat. And it took you a second, but you figured out it was pennies, not uh... <laughs> tell, tell us about that so people can get a better sense. So in Sephardic communities, it's common to sell the mitzvot on Shabbat as a way of raising money for the synagogue. So uh, I think in Ashkenazi synagogues, maybe they do it just on holidays. Uh, I'm not sure. But in the Sephardic synagogues, every Shabbat, they sell the mitzvot. And the mitzvot are like opening the the doors to the Sefer Torah, carrying the Sefer Torah, undressing it, doing the Hakama where you lift the Sefer Torah, uh, you know, stuff like that, or, or reading the Haftarah, they'll bid, all the, they'll auction it off, and in the two synagogues in Seward Park, they do the entire auction in Ladino, so they reference the, the whatever they're auctioning, they'll uh, reference in uh, Ladino, they'll reference the, the now the money now it's a little bit different because the way it used to, you know when we first community first started no one had a lot of money so they uh they auction everything off in pennies so now we instead of you know 10 pennies or 100 pennies now it's a thousand pennies so someone who's a spanish speaker it's very familiar the numbers would come in and hear it and and all of a sudden it's like, wait, you're selling the opening of the doors for a thousand dollars and it's really a thousand pennies. So uh, it, it's, you know, we've had a few Spanish speaking Jewish people who have come there and they're like very confused until someone says, oh no, it's bid in pennies. So, <laughs> uh, but again, that's a idea again of incorporating that into liturgy. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that they compromise using Ladino, but again, it's that's more like la, using Ladino in a poetic form for prayers for the Tefillah as opposed to using it in everyday language, you know. So, like yeah. on Shabbat, when they sing the Enkeloeno in Ladino, or when, uh, you know, on uh, Rosh Hashanah, you read the Hiratzones in Hebrew and Ladino. I mean, those are again, those things will always be there to read and always be done, but it's not, you know, like you said, it's not you know, lexicon of using words and using language. Again, that's sort of Ladino in its poetic form. And, uh, and it's beautiful language when you read it and you understand how it's written. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, well, I do think that both of those, the ritualized use of language and also the everyday use of heritage words are very valuable in keeping the language alive when it's not realistic to use it in, as a vernacular. Yeah, 100%. Okay, well, do you have any last thoughts about your ancestral language, identity, and community? Uh, it's a beautiful language. Uh, I live in a beautiful community. Uh, great people, great, great, uh, I would say, people that built this community. I mean, it's over 100 years old here. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful place where beautiful traditions. It's not for everybody, but if you ever want to come and experience it, you know, uh, experience what a, and again, not your traditional, it's different. It's very different than the Edut Mizrah, right? It's different than the Middle Eastern Judaism or North African Judaism. All, listen, everything is 75 to 80% the same. It's just the way we, you know, you go about doing it. Uh, and that's it. It's just a little bit different, but it's beautiful. And I would encourage everybody, if you ever want to come out to Seattle and experience it, or if you, you know, you don't live in Seattle and you have, you know, you're like, oh, my parents were Turkish, my parents were Greek, my grandparents were this, they were Latino speakers, but I didn't grow up with anything. Come on out here and experience it. I mean, uh, it's a lot of fun, but I'll tell you to come in the summer. It's a lot more fun in the summer. And can so, they also visit Sephardic Adventure Camp? They can definitely visit Sephardic Adventure Camp. And maybe Sarah will take you with her, you know, <laughs> to organize a trip to bring people to come to Sephardic Adventure Camp. Uh, you know, That's, how many like times have you come to camp? Just once. Oh, it's time for you to come back again. Well, I still remember the song uh, to the tune of Eye of the Tiger. Oh, okay. So I, I yes, the Oja La Hansa. That's uh, yeah. so myself and one of my friends, Jack Alma, we wrote that song for the camp when we were camp yeah. directors. Can you, can you, uh, would you mind singing no, it? I can't sing that. No, I can't sing it. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it, but it's a beautiful song. We, okay. So we just found that there used to be a song called We Are Sephardic Adventure Campers. And I, it's like one line and they used to sing it all the time. And then when Jack uh, and I were in charge of running camp that year, we're like, okay, we need to change it up and maybe let's write a song that, you know, what are we going to do every day to pump the camp up and get them excited for the day? And what's more, you know, what's more, what gets people more juiced up than, you know, the beginning of Eye of the Tiger, right? With the riff and everything. And so <laughs> we're like, let's write a song about the camp to Eye of the Tiger. And every day when we start, you know, after the and everyone comes in at breakfast and we want to start the day off, like we'll just fire up that song and we'll, teach the kids the words of the song and and we'll get it and and let's you know we'll see we'll see how that works and like you know it took us a few days you know to go through and kind of write like the three stanzas based on how it all fits in there and then that was 1997 and now it's 2024 and I just got a video from someone's wedding where they played it at they played I had to talk at the wedding but then the whole crowd was singing the camp song over the song as far as so I don't know if that means you've made it when they start singing the song you wrote at a wedding but uh, I love that it, yeah and that song has a lot of Ladino in it there's Ojo de yeah we threw a lot of Ladino in there you know we threw a lot of Ladino in there to sort of you know English Ladino there's a little Hebrew in there and it's all about driving up to Sephardic camp you know having fun and you know praying with the counselors right it's all about coming to camp learning tefila and experiencing the Sephardic culture and we try to incorporate all that into the camp and listen it's you know 30 years later they're still singing it and the lyrics might have gotten changed a little bit over time but that's okay uh but they every meal I mean that song gets fired up and they you know if you ever want to come experience that that's uh I would tell you Sarah you should come experience it again it's taken on like another another level I would love to. Well, Jay Danny, Jason, thank you so much for talking with us today and for all of this really interesting insight you've given us into uh, Ladino heritage words. My pleasure.